George Antill here with Dirt Live. A few years ago, I was at the Nora 1000 and I met this gentleman that touched my heart and I've become very close with him and his family. And his name is Jimmy Jeffries. And I say he is the pioneer of off-road racing. This guy started out back in the 60s. He was living down in Cabo later on after he left the fire department. And the story that he tells, and he'll be telling you in the next few minutes, is about his life and uh, what he went through starting out in the 60s, racing in the Mexican 1000 and building these race cars out of pretty much scraps and fabricating his own stuff back. You know, back in the 60s, we didn't have all the fabricating tools that they have now in racing. So uh, check this great story of Jimmy Jeffries. Hello, I'm Jimmy Jeffries, and I'm going to tell you a story about my life. Uh, when I graduated from high school in Santa Monica, I took welding classes at the Santa Monica Tech. And I did an interview at Douglas Aircraft and became an aircraft welder when I was still 17 years of age. I worked there until uh, another year and I was drafted into the Army. In the Army, it, they, I showed an aptitude for uh, mechanics and so I was, uh, ended up being a mechanic in the uh, MPs in Munich, stationed in Munich, Germany. There I did a lot of welding. When I got out of the uh, uh, service, I went back to uh, boat building. I went back w to working with my dad and, and his boat building where I welded and did engine conversions and so on and did the mechanical work for his boats. I uh, uh, heard about uh, an opportunity to join the fire department where my brother-in-law was working at the Beverly Hills Fire Department and he handed me an application one day and I filled it out, and uh, before I knew it, I was a Beverly Hills fireman, something I hadn't anticipated at all, but uh, very happy that I got, got the job. It was a wonderful job. Dur during the time that uh, I, I worked with my dad at the boat shop, uh, I built some cars uh, with his help. I was very young at the time, and uh, they were mostly street racers, cars that were very fast that you could still drive yourself. And I got involved in uh, drag racing and uh, joined the uh, Rosetta Timing Association. We had meets against uh, SCTA, another big organization, at both drags and at the dry lakes at uh, El Mirage. I was successful at all that. I won championships in drag racing and different classes and at the lakes. I established a record in the sports car at Del Mirage. Goes in the service and then he gets out, he joins the fire department and uh, he'll talk about the fire department. I joined the fire department in 1960 and it was, they soon understood that I had to make a lot of mechanical ability and I spent, they had their own shop, Beverly Hills was unique and that they maintained their own vehicles. So I ended up working in the shop uh, along with being a regular fireman. And while there, I uh, uh, converted uh, three different fire engines from gasoline engines to diesel and uh, uh, did a lot of other work, uh, installed an apparatus that uh, on the carburetors of various vehicles so that if the, a hose broke, the engines wouldn't over rev. The, would lower the RPM. Did a, I did a lot of work there. I helped them build an ambulance. Uh, we built it ourselves and I did a lot of that work also. So I've always been into uh, like fabrication. Uh, welding fabrication is what I'm really good at. And let's talk about his first trip to Baja. He goes down to Baja. His dad was building boats down there and experiences his first time down in Cabo right there on the beach. My uh, dad took a leave of absence from his boat building. He was uh, kind of worn out from it. And he got, had an opportunity. To, we built seven boats for the son of, the, of a former president of Mexico that had gone to Mexico to be used in the first hotel in Baja California, Southern Baja California. I went down to visit my dad on several occasions and loved the place. I rode his motorcycle and explored the backcountry and so on. 
And after returning home, after I think the first trip, I read an article about how, I think it was Bud Eakins, set a 40-hour record uh, riding motorcycles down Baja, California. And I thought, wow, what an interesting thing that would be. So I, I set out to build a car that I thought would be the right thing to do, uh, make a record in, but I'd never been down Baja, California. And I built a very unique vehicle, all hand-built, mostly with the junkyard parts and, and scrap. Actually, the chassis was made from an abandoned rug machine that I picked up and salvaged. I uh, built the car at home, and I was able, when it was uh, well enough along so it could be towed, I towed it to the fire station, and the fire chief, who was interested in my, my project, let me work on it in the evenings at the fire station. We did attempt to make a record, and uh, uh, it was rather a foolish attempt because I'd never even been down Baja, California, and I thought I could make it in 40 hours. We uh, didn't really prepare. It started out in the rain. We didn't bring food. Uh, we didn't have good clothing. It was January, and it turned out to be a terrible, terrible hardship trip, but some, one that I remember in relation, very happy I, still that I did it. It took us actually seven days to get down with all the breakdowns and difficulties we had. That was my first off-road trip down Baja, California. Builds his second vehicle, the Mulahe, down in Baja. I finished up the second car at the fire station. This would have been uh, a little bit before I worked on the Breedlove car, not 1962. I worked on the Breedlove car in 1965. So I started, uh, uh, I made it a three-seater so my wife could come along. And, uh, and uh, she had a son when I married her, a one-year-old son. And uh, I used the car to drive to Baja and back several times. Uh, uh, Nye Frank, uh, my good buddy, became very interested in uh, uh, going to Baja. He also traveled down back and forth in the same vehicle. Uh, on one of my trips uh, uh, north, I ran into uh, a Perlman, the founder of Nora, and uh, Don Francisco and uh, uh, a few of his cronies who had flat tires and uh, uh, borrowed tire patch from me. And they were telling me about their idea to have a race down the whole length of Baja, California. I thought they were kind of like Tender feet. They had vehicles, or very poor vehicles, regular Jeep things, and you know, rough riding cars, and uh, and they had flats, and were having a hard time dealing with them. I thought that they were uh, uh, not going to really be able to do go through with what they suggested. The next year, the race started in uh, 1967, and I still felt that they were amateurs. And I didn't enter it, the race. The very first Nora race, I did not enter it. Yet I had a vehicle that I could run in it. It hadn't been built specifically for racing, but it had possibility because a very good car, very well. Uh, did Baja very well. We made really fast times uh, down the down 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 the uh, to Cabo San Lucas. So the very next year, I did enter uh, the race with that car. Uh, only went 35 miles and was a very old and used Oldsmobile engine from a wrecking yard I had in it, and the engine lost its bearings. So I flew down from there, went back to Ensenada and flew down and watched the finish of the race and saw a lot of people finish and so on. The next year we, uh, we were better prepared, we got, I had more time to spend with the car, and even though we had uh, uh, lost a, one of my large 37-inch tires uh, and had to ride, I had to drive it more than a third of the race on a little small spare tire uh, that I picked up from somebody, a uh, 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 used tire. Uh, we still came in third in the unlimited class. So I'm, very, that's a, I'm rather proud of that uh, uh, achievement. And uh, 
After that, I, uh, I still use the car to drive back and forth. I used it every time for pre-running. I, uh, when I was in Baja, I went hunting and everything, fishing and hunting and backcountry riding. It was an amazing car. Uh, I, I uh, used it uh, after I eventually moved to Mexico. I moved to Mexico after my retirement because things were cheaper here and because I liked the place. I didn't have a very a lot of money to work with. And used the car for years until it uh, finally sat out two, in two different hurricanes, got salt water in the frame and it started rusting. I was unaware that this was happening and it rusted from the inside out and the car eventually broke in half. And just to jump way ahead of myself, I uh, just in the past few years, I completely rebuilt the car and, I, and it's running again, it looks beautiful and uh, I'm a nostalgia person. I, I'm also a collector, I collect items that interest me. So I, I have a hard time partying with my old friends and so I still have that car and I still use it. Coming up, Jimmy sets up a stake and builds a house right there on the beach in Cabo San Lucas. In 1963, I met some folks that uh, uh, were friends of my dad's, and they offered a piece of property on the beach at Cabo San Lucas. Now, the beach at San, Cabo San Lucas is beautiful. And at that time, there was nobody on it, no one at all. And it wasn't considered to be valuable to the people that lived here because there was no uh, uh, grass or food growing on it that would support cattle. The people here were all ranchers, or they worked at the cannery, canning fish. There was a cannery at, right at the Cape. Very low population. I'd estimate maybe 200 people were here then. Well, that was in 1963. I bought the property. In 19, uh, uh, and about 1964, my mother and father separated. It was due to a, a poor business deal he'd made down here in Mexico, and he'd lost almost everything he owned and needed to find work elsewhere. He went to the Philippines, he started building boats for a rich uh, a lumberman over there. My mother was left with, uh, uh, to kind of fend for herself, and she took a lot of the plywood that was from my bad dad's boat building business in, in, at Hotel Cabo San Lucas, moved it over to my piece of property, and with the help of our foreman, Bob Langman, who is now my brother-in-law, he married my ex-wife's sister, they built a home out of plywood. They, they, my mother lived there maybe three years until she met someone and divorced my father and was remarried and moved out of the house and Bob Langman, my brother-in-law, moved in. When I became retired, my pension was only $350 a month. And I knew I had a home in Cabo San Lucas. My wife was from Mexico. I liked Mexico. So we decided to move down into the vacated home of my mother's on my property. So I moved there. First thing I got here, there was lawsuits. Somebody said that that property really belonged to them and I spent Almost seven years in the courts with very little money, it was very, very difficult for me. But the saving feature was that I could go diving, spear fishing, hunting, and, and, and survive uh, like an Indian. <laughs> and, and, and it wasn't that, it wasn't that what, discomfortable? It was very fun uh, to live that way, frugally and off the land, uh, more or less. Uh, I, 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 I uh, love those days, they're past. We can't go hunting, we can't go spear fishing like we could. But when I was on the beach, I, was, had, I had the only home on the old San Lucas Beach. Uh, in fact, for years it was that way. The beach is two miles long. Uh, I used the mula, the, that's what I call the car that I built to pull my boat, my ponga, in and out of the water, right from in front of my home. It was a, idyllic. The home I built was a simple, or my mother built, was simple. Instead of windows, it had shutters that you could just 
swing open, open on hinges and prop up with a piece of bamboo. We didn't need air conditioning and it was very, very comfortable to live there. The only thing that, that I, I would say was sort of uncomfortable and dangerous were hurricanes. Probably I've lived through maybe 12 hurricanes and right at the beach when, it, when you're on a dune, the wind even increases as it comes sliding up over the dunes and so there, I've, I've been in some very hairy, scary weather. I worked at the uh, Beverly Hills Fire Department from 1960 to 1969. In 1969 I'd injured uh, uh, me in the line of duty and retired early from the fire department. He builds his second vehicle, the Mulahe, down in Baja and uses it for going up in the hills and uh, finding all these fossils. Pretty cool. Because of my uh, having the Mula del Diablo, that's the name of my off-road car that I use for transportation and for racing, I spent a lot of time in the back country and I found fossils. Uh, I didn't even know what they were at first, but they were from Carcaridon Megalodon, a 40-foot uh, shark that lived six million years ago. I started uh, doing that often, became obsessed with it more or less, and found all kinds of fossils. And in fact, I, I, I discovered all the fossils that have ever been found in Southern Baja, California, uh, even land mammals. Uh, first marine mammals, which were six million years old, then land mammals that were three and a half million years old. Aside from the giant sharks, I found mastodons, camels, horses, uh, some of the animals uh, we've done uh, scientific papers on and they bear my name because they're new to science. I spent a lot of time, I'm jumping around, but I spent a lot of time spear fishing. I went speared, a, I thought better of it for a while, but I speared a 116 pound Pez Fuerte under the beer, uh, which with an inner tube, uh, no air tanks, or the inner tube uh, attached to the line. Uh, fortunately, somebody saw me do it because the fish towed me a mile out in the ocean and someone had to come and get me. We had a little tube where some of the offal from uh, preparing the fish would run out and because of that there were thousands and thousands of beautiful fish hovering around the dock and the cannery. You, it was so, you couldn't even see through them, there were so many of them. And in those days, big fish would come in. So you could, you could be right in by the shore, right near the pier, and spear a fish that weighed 160. 116 pounds. Those this is Jim Jeffries. He also searches for great sharks in a desert once covered by water. The sharks lived here millions of years ago. He finds their remains. Some of them were enormous. Jim Jeffries. I met the sea when I was a child, and for more than 30 years, my love for the ocean has been a constant source of inspiration. During these years, I have come to know many fascinating people of this frontier who share my love and concern for the sea. During the next 30 minutes, we will meet Juan and Jim and learn what it is about the sea that has captured their interest and directed their lives. Remember what I told you on the phone? Yeah. In Sydney? Mm -hmm. Well, I want to show you something. This is what we're going to look at at Cabo San Lucas. Good heavens! <laughs> What Isn't an it something? enormous <laughs> tooth. And this is not the largest one. There are some much bigger. It looks like it's from the white shark. We don't know for sure if it is the white shark, but it's probably a relative of the white shark. Wow. <laughs> Let's go. We'll see plenty of them down Cabo. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Jim's two daughters, Annalisa and Heidi, lead Jean-Michel and Ron across the bay to a beach where Jeffries waits for them. Jimmy, we're on our way, Ron Taylor and myself, and we'll meet you on the shore. Very well, very well. I'll meet you here to my end. The surging waters are difficult along this part of the coast, and experience has taught them to bring the boat in backwards to avoid being capsized by a tricky wave. Oh, a beauty. Oh. OK. What was uh, Ron Taylor? Hello, oh, Ron. Very pleased to meet you. Same here. I've heard a lot about you, and I'm glad to meet you. Yeah, we finally sure. made it, you know. <laughs> Listen, uh, the truck's up here. Should we go see some fossils? Let's go. All right, let's go. 
For Jim Jeffries, searching for fossils is a family project. The land is rugged, the heat intense. But to Annalisa and Heidi, the search for fossils is always fun. I like to take my daughters with me because they're not too tall and they have excellent eyes. And uh, it takes uh, very good eyes and to be close to the ground to be able to spot these uh, fossils. Is it uh, because you, uh, you were their teacher or is it because they like the land more than they do like the ocean? I think that the children really enjoy coming out and being out in the uh, uh, countryside looking for fossils. Uh, uh, it's kind of like a glorious Easter egg hunt. If you remember correctly, this is a place where we'll find a few fossil whale bones down in this little canyon here. Right. This uh, canyon is eroded away and exposed a whole column of bones here. Should we go down and take a look? We haven't really found anything uh, organic in the area to date yet, but uh, from the fossil remains that are here, they all fit into the Miocene era. 25 million years ago, in a time period called the Miocene epoch, this land was totally covered by water. During that ancient time, huge sharks and prehistoric whales inhabited the ocean. Jeffries has found unmistakable proof of their existence preserved in the rocks and stones of the area. Big fella, huh? Oh, yeah. It is strange to stand in the middle of a desert and find the remains of these mammoth ocean creatures. Hey, Papa! Come here, look what I found down here. The girls spot something which has stood in the same place for millions of years and which Jeffries has seen many times, the rib cage from a whale. Bones from animals like the whale have become fossils to be preserved through the ages. There are no shark bones here. Sharks have no bones, only cartilage, which easily decomposes. And all that remains from their existence are some of their incredibly hard teeth, which fell to the ocean floor and were protected through the centuries. In particular, you look for. You keep your eyes close to the ground and, uh, and just try to identify a tooth. Ron and Jean Michel join the search, determined to find some of these unusual treasures. But the teeth are difficult to spot. It's hard to tell where the earth ends and the fossils begin, or where a tooth may be hidden in the stones in sediment. His eyes are trained to scan the rock layers. Ah, here we go. And he spots one buried in the hillside. It's a little bit broken, but it looks like it's all here. Oh, that's good size, too. Let's see if we can't get that fell out of there more or less in one piece. Jim is always excited when he finds a tooth. He wants it to be perfect. Likely to be more than one there? Uh, no. But it's painstaking work and requires patience to retrieve it, chipping away the soil little by little. And everyone around is anxious to see the end result. Unlike the whale bones that have turned to stone, these are still the actual teeth of the shark. This shark tooth is so hard that it has remained virtually unchanged since it took its last bite more than 20 million years ago. Take this little piece. Their trip is a success. This is what they came for. Uh, Jimmy building the Mulahe and rebuilding it for races coming up later on that he entered in the Nora 1000. Del Diablo is actually the first trophy truck. I mean, 20 years ahead of other trophy trucks. Uh, it's unique, it's, it's, it does look like a trophy truck. It has a solid rear axle. It, ha it, it has a center steering position, which is also something they just do lately that I had in here in 1965. 37-inch uh, uh, tires, they didn't come into vogue until just re recently also. The original I used were off an airplane, off a Convair. I had to make my own wheels. I couldn't balance them back then. It was impossible. They didn't have machines that held tires that big. So I'm quite proud of it. I think it, the vehicle is ahead of its time. Uh, it, it, it's 
always been a very easy car to drive. Uh, it, uh, we, I had to rebuild it for this race. It was in left. It was in terrible condition when I decided to rebuild it, and uh, it took me three times as long to rebuild it as it did to, for me to build it originally. And the basic problem was finding parts like old steering heads and shock absorbers. The, the shock absorbers are off of a World War II tank. And uh, uh, those things were so hard to replace. In fact, the shocks aren't good. The best ones I could find are not like the originals. They're the same as originals, but they're in poor shape. Uh, the car looks heavy, but the fenders are plywood, laminated plywood. I was able to do that because I'm a former boat builder. I used to work with my dad. And uh, I built a good portion of this car at the fire station in Beverly Hills where I was a fireman. They, I was the, uh, the master mechanic there for a while. They do their own maintenance work. And I was able to bring the car in in the evenings and, and, and work on it and, and uh, during working hours. So it was really, what a great, that was a great job by the way. Being a fireman also allowed me to come down to Baja. You can trade shifts. You only work every other day, 24 hours a day. I can trade shifts with other firemen. You can put your holidays together. And way back then, even when I, while I had a full-time job, I could come down two months out of the year and visit Baja, California. Now, I did that in this vehicle. I drove back and forth. Uh, uh, from Baja to Cabo San Lucas where I visit my family, my mother and father who were building boats down here in this area. That's why I built the car, not for racing. There was no racing then. There was no Meyer, Myers Manx then even. They, they came soon though. So that's, I'm very proud of, uh, of the originality of this car. The last uh, Nora race the car was in, I left it in Mexico because that's where I already lived. I had moved there previously. so. So I wanted the car down here. After using it for many years, doing all sorts of tasks with it, fossil hunting, I've done uh, 10 years of fossil hunting, backcountry, the car is perfect for that. I worked with the University of Mexico locating fossil locations. Uh, uh, pulling my boat in and out of the water on the beach and all those sort of things. Eventually it sat on the beach in, in two hurricanes and the salt water got into the frame, the tub tubular frame, and rotted it from the inside out. And one day I got in a car and it just broke. That had almost broken too. So I left it. And it was just sitting down in my uh, lower 40, you might call it. Got covered with mud from a flood and sat there for 20 years, I guess. Uh, I'm just guessing, 20 years. And one of my friends that's in, into uh, modern times off road racing visited, saw the car, said, told me that car is famous. It shouldn't be just sitting there rotting away like that. He said, why don't you let me help you and I'll restore it for you. I said, well, I, I don't know. I think it would be a lot of work. He said, well, let me do it. He said, I'll, I'll get the car restored and I'll talk to Score and we'll restore the trailer broken to his shop. He started on it and very, very soon was overwhelmed. He couldn't understand exactly. He's a smart guy, but he's a younger man. He didn't, couldn't understand exactly how I made things, the wood laminations and, and so where any of the parts came from and so on. So he just got stymied and, and stopped. So, so I retrieved the car and I worked on it for the last three years, maybe, maybe almost four, restoring it. I'm not young anymore, so I'm not very fast. Taking me way longer. Take, I had to find parts that have to be sent down, shipped down. I used eBay a lot. And uh, um, uh, by the time last year, the car was getting nearly completed and I, Nora came out. And then I changed my mind. I, thought, I, I said to myself, I want to be in the Nora race. But I couldn't make it. And I said, said to myself, well, gosh, I'll get ready for the next Nora. But it turned out working as hard as I could, the car still wasn't ready. And uh, I had some setbacks. The shock absorbers that I, I found in New York, similar shock absorbers to the original ones, which, which I'd lost. Uh, somebody took them off the car while it was uh, setting. Came from a trolley. I, I thought for sure I'd never find any, but I found some similar shock off a trolley. And they're not, but they're not good. And uh, we tried really hard the last week, two weeks, 
to get the, the shocks to work right, and we were unable to. So the car did not perform as we hoped it would. It didn't work near as good as it did originally. Um, the steering uh, head is a uh, uh, broke also, exploded. Couldn't remember what I got it from. Couldn't find it in any books. Uh, uh, found one similar. Uh, tried to get it air freighted. Holidays, Easter came up. Didn't get it here, so we machined some parts for it and got it going. Anyway, very hectic, very nerve-wracking. And uh, uh, we did get it together, but it's not at all like I hoped it would be. It was, it was a handful to keep it going. Now we entered the race. I drove the first part. I have very poor vision. I drove the Laguna Salada part, which is ideal for me because <laughs> it's a 10 miles wide or so, <laughs> and no traffic coming the other way. And uh, my son took over for there, and, and my daughter drove to the, the, uh, from, town, from town out to the racetrack, and then she flew back down here to be in the, the uh, Dos Morris race in her own car, which is held simultaneously. So I was, by that time, I was following a car in a regular vehicle. We were, we were waiting for it to arrive. It showed up uh, making awful sounds in the rear end, differential again. Limped into town maybe going 10 miles an hour. I was holding my breath all the way, so was the rest of my family. It got through the, the checkpoint, the finish line, where we get to stay overnight in Loretto. Went only 20 feet and absolutely stopped. The rear end was destroyed. In Loretto, we're really well known. We race there with our more modern cars. So someone right away offered us a differential. Uh, and one of the racers, the one that had a, a the guy that had a Parnelli Bronco, his car was broken. He offered let it, to let us take it out of it. What a nice guy, by the way. Anyway, we accepted the other one, the other offer, because it was already out of a car. And put that differential in the car, uh, removed the oil uh, 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 cooler, and made it direct, with a, with put, the, put the filter back, back on the side of the engine where it used to be originally, and uh, managed everything up, and finally made it to the finish line. We, we, were, we were late. Uh, I mean, we weren't late. We made it in, in, in under the time, but we weren't winners. And it turned out we were, we were uh, fourth place in our class. Uh, it, it, I must mention, too, that I didn't see any other cars that I recall from being in the races when I was. I don't think all the cars were newer. Uh, they, were, they could have cars that were allowed to be in, in, in a race that had never raced in Nora. Nora was finished in 1972. And uh, so this is about the only car, I think, that was really from that time. May have been a couple others. So we didn't know if there would be trophies or money or anything. It doesn't say that anywhere on the Nora thing. So we waited around because score pays back to fifth place. We were in a thousand with our class one car. In the last race we got fourth place. We got a pretty good check and a nice trophy. We thought, and Nora originally gave back to five places too, the original Nora, and also gave us some cash money. At least it was the entrance fee even for fifth place. So we waited around and uh, we were very disappointed. I'm extremely disappointed because I got nothing whatsoever to show that I was even in the race. And I have, really, I don't, I'm not bragging, but I have thousands of fans in Mexico that are keeping their eye on this car and, 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 and I would love to see the, something, you know, some result from the race. They are happy that I made it and, uh, and, and I am too, but uh, it's, what, uh, it's a race that we finished and don't have anything to show for.